The following is an incomplete recording of a lecture given by Dr. R. T. D. Jones of the College Balabangor entitled The Relevance of the Reformation. For the permission to sell the pardon, the Pope had arranged with one of the princes, Prince Albert, that he should have 50% of the takings and the other 50% would go up to Rome to help build the Church of St. Peter's. And when Luther heard that Paisel was to come to a village just over the border, from the part of Germany where he lived, the electors of Saxony, he decided that the time had come to strike. And so he walked that October evening to nail up his poster on the door of the castle church, because next day would be the great day in the castle church, the day when people would throng the city in order to see the vast collection of relics that the pious elector had collected from all parts of Europe into his castle church. A lock of St. Peter's hair, a drop of the virgin's milk, a piece of the true cross, part of the spear with which our Lord was bruised on the cross. They were all there. And whoever made the pilgrimage to Wittenberg, he would gain immense spiritual benefits. Thousands of years would cut off, we cut off his penal servitude in purgatory. So it was the day to set the poster up. But the poster challenged the whole system right down to its foundations. And that is why we celebrate October the 31st, 1967, the 450th anniversary of that intensely dramatic event. Because Luther, of course, in 1517, he hadn't developed his full Protestant position. But he got hold of the main element in it. And the main element in it was quite simply this, that God forgives sinners directly through the sacrifice of Jesus, without benefit of Pope or priest or monastery, or letters of pardon, or anything else. And you see, this is why it was the dawn of the Reformation. Now, let me throw out one or two of the implications, and do it as simply as I can, because Luther again and again used to say, the glorious thing is that the Gospel is so simple. What is the Church of God, he asks in one of his books. Well, thank God, he said, the child of seven years can answer that question. The Church of God is Jesus Christ's lambs and sheep. And um, in deference to Luther, I'm sure he's quite right, since he, more than anybody else in that period, put the joy and the victory of the Gospel in the hands of common, ordinary people, so I think we, particularly this evening, should try and name the great points of this Gospel as simply and as directly as we can. The first point he makes, I think Alan has already mentioned it, and a thing that needs to be emphasized again and again these days. What Luther said, and all the reformers, was this. God's preparation for sinners is complete. You can't add anything to it. No man can add anything to it. Christ's work on Calvary is a completed work. It is finished. Completed entire. Using one of the great images of Jesus in the Gospels, the feast, the feast is complete in every detail. All you need to do is to come to it. You need to bring your food with you, there's no point in it. The feast is complete. And I often think that this is precisely where much of our contemporary Christianity has got completely lost. This pathetic desire to persuade ourselves that we can add something to what God has done. Just as medieval men tortured himself with the belief that if only I could be just a little better, then I, I would be acceptable to God. If I only buy a few more letters of pardon, then the gates of heaven will open. If I go on just one more pilgrimage, then I shall be all right, I shall be safe. No, says Luther, what, what, what's all this fuss about? God has completed the work of salvation. Now I know that 
what do people often say, and I'm here yeah, relating the Reformation part over here, and other people say, well, man then uh, has no place at all in this. Man can't contribute, he can't cooperate. Well, certainly not. Well, therefore, we are faced with something like spiritual totalitarianism. No, 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 no. No, says Luther, not at all. That's the mistake. All is of grace. It's of the kindness of God. When man was completely unable to help himself, God made a complete preparation for him. Salvation is entire and whole. So we have no part in it, not at all. Of course we have a part in it. What do we have to do? Well, says Luther, our part in transaction is to believe. That's not much. On the contrary, it's a little for that everything. That everything. To believe. So that the gospel comes to us as an invitation. An invitation that indeed warns us of the intense seriousness of refusing it. There is this dark side to it, obviously. Because we're talking about salvation. And there's only one salvation. And if people refuse that salvation, obviously, there's darkness, death, and hell, as to use some of Luther's favorite words in this great uh, connection, there's obviously that side to it. But we need to dwell on that, because we are offered salvation of the grace of God. Now, it's worth emphasizing this, because I think if you read Luther himself, and by the way, Luther of all modern theologians is the most readable. He's rather frightening his readability in some places because Luther, of course, um, suffered, didn't suffer at all from any kind of Victorian respectability, which people find rather shocking. But what you do find in Luther is an intense joy. He was, in some ways, the most humorous of the great Christian leaders of the century. He could laugh, a mighty laugh, we are told by some of his students, until the lecture room shook. <laughs> and he used to laugh quite particularly when he thought of the Pope and the Cardinal and all that crowd struggling hard to get into heaven. And the gate was open already. <laughs> all they had to do was to believe that that was more than they could do. And then followed this great mighty laugh that reverberated throughout Europe. Yes, the, the joy. You see, at last, the fears, the horror, the terror that had haunted his childhood had gone. There's no need to be afraid. God rules. And God has made entire and adequate preparation for us all. Another thing that follows is this. Our justification, then, we must mention the great phrase of the Reformation, justification is by faith alone, by believing alone. Why should we believe? On what authority do we, do we believe? Ah, said Luther, we believe on the authority of God's own word. Now, how can we test the word of God to see if it's true? Don't be cheeky, said Luther. <laughs> how, how can you measure the word of God? Who are you to take out your, your, your footstool to see if, if the word of God is true? You just can't do it. This is the mighty, I must use a Greek word here, the mighty Kubris. Will you the Greek the cheek? The mighty Kubris <laughs> of medieval man, you see? And of the Greeks of all ages. The people who suppose that when God speaks, then a committee can sit down and decide whether he's saying the truth or not. That's the nonsense of truth. When God speaks, all that you can do is to believe you. And to rest entirely on what God says. If you do that, you'll find that it is in fact true, says Luther. Now this is the classical um, Protestant reform expression of the doctrine of the authority of the word of God. David was telling us about the new book which he tells us we must read, so we must read it. <laughs> I, always have, I always have the greatest respect for my students when they tell me what I ought to read. <laughs> because they never seem to read anything I tell them. <laughs> but the point is, it is taken, isn't it? The infallibility of the Word of God. Anything else is quite impossible. It's quite illogical. It doesn't make sense. After all, 
You can't rely on God. Who on earth can you rely on? These are the points that we look for making all the time. It follows then, when you take those two great principles, the creative principles of the Reformation, justification by faith, the authority of the Word of God, gospel, which is the essence of the Bible, I just want to mention two things that follow. First of all, the church is now put in its place. We've seen that all in, the, in the medieval period, the church was the channel which deployed God's grace. It had a monopoly on grace. You couldn't get at God's grace except through the valley, the authorized channels of the church, its sacraments, its ministry. You couldn't just get, to, get together and say, well, now we'll have a communion. No, no, there was no such thing as a communion, apart from the authorized ministrations of a duly ordained priest. You might go through the motions. You might even use the words of the liturgy correctly, but it would be no communion. Because a communion depended on the intervention of the valid officer of the church. It was he and he alone who could dispense grace. And because he had this monopoly, and you see grace was necessary before you could go to heaven, your eternal salvation depended upon it. So the eternal salvation of the whole of Europe was in the hands of the, of the church, embodied in the Pope. Hence its authority. So the church became a mighty empire. It lorded it over Europe. It could frighten men right to the marrow of their souls. It could even go on strike, as it did. Is it King John of England, for example? The church, the Catholic church in England, fortunately in Wales in those days, we were on our own. <laughs> <laughs> King John's daughter, Joan, was the wife of some relatives. They lived in Abbey, just along here. <laughs> Joan, you know, some of you may know that. Joan was, in fact, buried across the water in Sandwise, the, the Franciscan priory there, the daughter of King John of England. But King John, he fell foul of the Pope, and the church went on strike. No communion, no confession, no baptisms, no registration of births, marriages, and deaths, no wills, because all this sort of thing was in the hands of the church courts. Everything just stopped, and that meant hell. These have meant hell for many evil men. Uh, you see, the church could monopolize spiritual terror. But, you see, once Luther had established the biblical principle that, in fact, God, in his word, deals directly with a the sinner, then the church is put in its precise place. And the church's place is as a witness. And that's what he meant by saying that the true treasure of the church is the holy gospel of God. That's all we've got, really, is the message, the witness, the gospel, the good news that forgiveness is available to all who believe. And so now the church becomes a servant. The church is no longer the extension of the incarnation, probably the most blasphemous conception that Christians have ever thought of. The church as the extension, the extension of the incarnation, certainly not. The Holy Spirit is the extension of the incarnation, the incarnation. The Holy Spirit, he testifies to Christ. He continues the ministry of our Lord in the souls and hearts of his people, the church. But then you see, what had happened in the medieval period was that the Holy Spirit had been forgotten. In fact, what had happened was that the Holy Spirit had been transformed into canon law. The rules and regulations of the church were now the Holy Spirit. If you wanted to know where the church was going, you turned up the law books. You didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. The church then takes its place now as the company of believers centered on the Word of God, whose business it is to proclaim God's grace. The sacraments now become not a complex way of holding people in spiritual form, 
Now the sacraments become seals of God's word. And the covenant that God has made with men, they become themselves part of the witness to the all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And finally, the last, I'm last thing, well, I'm very, I thought I'd be done before this. It's very good of you to listen with such patience. The last point I want to make is this, and I think this is tremendously relevant just at the present time. We're being overwhelmed at the moment by this all this talk about secular theology. Part of what is wrong with all this talk about secular theology is that people don't read the reformers anymore. I mentioned earlier on the image of the ship, crowned full of priests, prelates, archdeacons, popes, cardinals, and so on. Religion in the in Middle Ages has come to mean the, the hierarchy of the church. In fact, even a 19th century pope says that the church is divided into two. On the one hand, the ministers, which, are, which together make the church proper, and the faithful, whose business it is to follow the officials of the church. So that those who are most likely to achieve salvation would be religious people, that is, monks, priests, and so on. But your hopes were distinctly dim if you were a shoemaker, or a builder, or a farmer. If you wanted to be made, made sure of heaven, it would be an awfully good idea to give up your farming and become a monk. Now, said Luther, this is all nonsense. Because the secular world is also the world of God. <clears throat> is ordained by God, and Jesus Christ rules in our daily callings exactly as he does in the church. So that a farmer, or a shoemaker, or any other kind of calling that you may like to name, they also are called, and hence you see, the use of the word calling, or vocation, for the work that people do. This is a heritage of the Reformation. The idea that the work we are doing in the secular world, the profession that we follow, is itself a calling, a vocation. We are serving God, we are fighting the battle of faith, wherever we are. And it is there that the vast majority of Christians, in fact, prove their faith and testify to it. And it is the business of the church, its first business, its main business, and in the end its only business is, not as happened in the medieval period, you see the church becomes so terribly secularized. You have these princes and cardinals collecting statues and employing Botticelli and Michelangelo to adorn churches, all very nice, very wonderful no doubt, but what on earth had all this to do with Jesus of Nazareth? No, it was the business of the church to bear witness to the word of God, to the gospel. And the essence of the matter for Luther is forgiveness, justifying faith, faith that God is willing and eager to justify us in his Son. And so we turn out to our secular world, imbued with this faith, with this faith, and subduing our secular life to the will of God, which has now become a living thing. And a living thing because the Bible is now to be open. It's not the closed textbook of professional Christians in the churches. It is a book now for everybody. And hence, we Welsh people this year with great joy are celebrating the translation, the first translation of the New Testament into Welsh by one of the greatest Welsh disciple of Martin Luther, William Tyndale. And that is symbolic of what was happening throughout Europe. The Bible was being released, taken out of its prison, and being put in the hands of ordinary people. So that the farmer, when he came in of an evening after the day's work, he too could open his Bible and could refresh his soul there. And I'm sure that part of the relevance of the Reformation is that we need to get back there. 
Szokotárnyi, hogy ezt a munkatárs királyhoz képest is van, 